Good morning. My name is Dr. Catherine Carbone, and I am the superintendent of Bristol Public Schools. I would like to begin by welcoming Governor Ned Lamont and the governor's office, Acting Commissioner Charlene Russell Tucker and the Connecticut State Department of Education, Bristol Mayor Ellen Zappo Sasu, as well as our community members in Bristol Public Schools. I would also like to give an extended thank you to Principal Scott Gaudet and the Green Hills School community for hosting us this morning. A few months ago, we created a think tank comprising of over 100 of our employees to discuss and examine what worked and what did not work for our scholars, staff, and families over the past 14 months. We identified our strengths and our areas in need of improvement. The feedback and information gathered during this think tank session resulted in the formation of a smaller needs assessment team linked to the four priorities outlined in the elementary secondary school relief or ESSER fund. Throughout this process, as well as during the entirety of our district's response to teaching and learning through the various stages of the pandemic, we partnered with the Bristol Association of Principals and Supervisors and the Bristol Federation of Teachers. Their partnership and collaboration was and is the hallmark of why Bristol Public Schools is so successful. Our community partnerships with the Bristol Park and Rec Department, Boys and Girls Club of Bristol and the Barnes Nature Center supported our families during the early stages of the pandemic and our reopening plan and will continue to be our community partners as we create enrichment and recreational programs throughout the summer and next school year. Collectively, we have lived up to the Bristol motto of city of all heart. Our district goals to improve student outcomes and ensure that every scholar and every school excels at high levels are paramount as we strive to become a district model of excellence. It is our responsibility to ensure that our scholars graduate with the skills necessary to be successful for their future academic and professional careers. The funds provided by ESSER II and ESSER ARP will be used directly to achieve those goals. I would like to introduce Carly Fortin, our Director of Teaching and Learning, to discuss the use of these funds in greater detail. Carly. Good morning, everyone. I get to share how we're going to use all of the funds to support our goals here within Bristol Public Schools. I think you could tell from this morning that Bristol has elected not to focus on what was lost in the pandemic, but rather on what we found. We found scholars who are rising to the challenges ahead of them, exceeding the expectations that we've set. We found educators who will stop at nothing to ensure that their students are safe, well, and learning. And we found that our Bristol community is standing to lift up its schools as beacons of hope. The funds through ESSER II have turned what might have been obstacles into opportunities. With the collaboration that Dr. Carbone has mentioned of over 125 stakeholders within our school system, Bristol has developed a plan to move forward into the future, advancing learning through clear and challenging expectations, purposeful and meaningful engagement and personalized programming. ESSER II will be used to fund three programs here in Bristol, all of which will support our Bristol pre-K through 12 scholars. They are the Bristol Advance, Bristol Bolster, and Bristol Aspire. The first program, Bristol Advance, plans for student, and student learning and engagement throughout the summer. For our youngest scholars, scholars entering pre-kindergarten and kindergarten, we have personalized programming to support transitioning into our schools. For our elementary scholars, we have coupled learning experiences with engaging enrichment activities in our advanced summer camp, where students will have the opportunity to advance their learning in a camp-like atmosphere. Our middle school students will use the AVID algebra program, AVID the acronym for advancement via individual determination, so that these students can enter their eighth grade year ready to meet the rigor of our challenging curriculum. High school students in our summer advance will have the opportunity to recover credit, but again, being future focused, they'll also have the opportunity to earn elective credit, to explore college opportunities, to investigate career options, and even score summer employment through an exciting partnership that we have with the United Way, who will be offering employment for up to 30 of our high school students. We have also dedicated ESSER funding to advance the learning of students with special needs. 
emerging bilingual students and students experiencing homelessness through learning opportunities personalized to their individual strengths and unique experiences. That was what's happening this summer. Our bolster program will focus on what's happening next school year. We will be supporting our students' acceleration and growth through in-class supports in our classrooms from pre-K up through grade 12. Esther, Esther Bristol Bolster will provide kindergarten teaching assistance to support students' transition into school, math and literacy instructional teachers who can provide real-time scaffolding as students need it, and on-track coordinators for our high school students, ensuring that when they enter from middle school all the way through high school graduation, our students are fully supported. So we've talked about the Advance, which is summer, Bolster, which is next school year, and now Aspire, the third program funded under ESSER. Bristol Aspire will provide cross-age tutoring for Bristol scholars across the next two years, giving our scholars the academic support they may need, while also providing role models, individuals to whom students may aspire to. Through our university partnerships with the University of Connecticut and Central Connecticut State University, our college interns will have the opportunity to tutor our high school scholars. And in turn, our high school scholars, scholars will become trained tutors for our middle school and elementary scholars as well. Bristol Public Schools is not looking back. We are focused on our future. Our scholars will graduate from schools, our schools self-sufficient and ready to make meaningful contributions to our global society. Thank you. As we highlighted during our tour, our partnership with the City of Bristol and the Mayor's Office is st stronger now more than ever, and I would like to introduce Mayor Ellen Zappo Sasser. So I'd like to thank both of you for coming. I think the tour spoke for itself in terms of the accomplishments of our Board of Education during the pandemic. But I think it's really important for everyone to capitalize on what Dr. Carbone said, is that we are an all heart community and it has been an all hands on deck. And we are looking forward to the American Rescue Plan. We have formed our task force, we are ready to go. And we are going to ensure that we leverage every dollar that comes to the municipality and to the Board of Education for the greater benefit of our community. That's why our park superintendent is here. That's why the family resource centers are going to play a critical role. And there's about 15 other organizations that are poised to ensure that our community emerges from this stronger than when we entered it. So thank you for your support throughout the pandemic. I appreciated all the weekly phone calls and all of the support that we received from all of your departments. And I think that what you saw today is emblemic of how well we've survived it and looking forward from now. Thank you. It is always nice to match the face with the voice over the past year um, of our Tuesday calls. Um, as we navigated these unprecedented times over the past 14 months, the Connecticut Department of Education has communicated with our districts at every step of the way. It is my pleasure to introduce Acting Commissioner Charlene Russell Tucker. Thank you, Dr. Carbone, and good morning. I am just so thrilled, uh, having done the tour, to see in action exactly what we had planned to see with utilizing these funds. So I express a sincere gratitude on behalf of the Department of Education to Dr. Carbone, the administrators, teachers, paraeducators, the Family Resource Center staff, and all the families for their patience and continued hard work as we adapt to changing circumstances during the pandemic. The fact that Connecticut schools have offered substantial in-person learning opportunities this school year with only some minor interruptions is a testament to the willingness and success of our school community, it takes a village, uh, to work together to protect each other and to protect in-person learning. The American Rescue Plan has given us a great opportunity to employ new, innovative, and high-quality programming to accelerate our children's learning and so they can also have fun this summer while they learn, uh, and also to ensure that we're addressing their social emotional well-being. So we're pleased, Governor, under your leadership that state agencies are indeed working together in great partnership so that we can continue this forward thinking focus on our students' academic and social no emotional needs to make sure learning is happening every day, everywhere. I'm so glad to see Parks and Recreation here. 
and to hear about even the employment opportunities for our young people. As the governor said, it's time to be bold, to challenge the current structures we have in, in place and to stretch our creativity. And that's what we saw in action here today. And so we are so grateful to see how the ESSA II funds were used and also your plan to engage the entire community for the new funding that's coming forward. So I look forward to seeing, if you've done this now with ESSA I and ESSA II, Dr. Carbone and, and team, I'm excited to see what will be continuing under the new monies that you've received. Making transformative investments to re-engage our students, especially those disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, is a commitment that we all hold together. And so now it's time for us to be vigilant and to go forward. The State Department of Education is here to continue to support you every Tuesday morning. We have our Health and Safety Tuesdays. I like to call it now since August 4th. Every Tuesday morning with 600 or so of our closest friends. So we can talk about what's emerging, what's going right, and what are those things we still need to address. So thank you all very much. On behalf of our students, you're doing a great job here in Bristol. We look forward to learning more from you so we can make sure that all our kids are positioned not only for now for the summer and have fun, but to be ready for the fall as well. So thank you very much for having us. Thank you. As we know, leadership starts at the top. In times of uncertainty, it is difficult to formulate best practices and strategies. As educators, we appreciate the emphasis and the importance of strategic and deliberate actions to support our schools, our staff, and our scholars from the governor's office. It is my privilege to introduce our final speaker, the 89th governor of Connecticut, Governor Ned Lamont. Hey, well, thank you, Dr. Carbone. And, um, you know, being a Green Hill Gator is a pretty good thing. And uh, I'd recommend that to any kid who had that opportunity. Uh, I love what they were able to do. This school has been open since September, had to build up confidence, right, Charlene, a little bit um, all along the way. Uh, but as you showed me in the first class we went to, um, these kids learned a lot, even when they weren't in the classroom. And a lot of that was due to the fact that you were reaching out to the parents. That's what I heard, Carly, reaching out to the parents, staying involved, seeing what kids were not coming in, why they weren't coming in, and see how the parents could help out with the learning. I think that was so key and something we should learn from as we take it around the state. I also, uh, I kind of got a kick out of squad. <laughs> squad is sort of a multimedia visual representation of what a kid may be thinking. And uh, they showed me um, sort of eight different basketball scenes. And I, uh, they said, well, which one do you identify with? Well, I saw LeBron slam dunking, so I said, I'll, I'll go with LeBron. I could recognize it. But then I saw um, another little clip of uh, somebody who kept shooting and missing the basket. And I saw a clip of somebody who didn't really want to shoot the basket at all. And then the kids were able to talk about this. So when Charlene talks about social and emotional, bringing kids back, kids who have been isolated for an awful long time, you know, Squad made it meaningful for me. And this is a, a school that really cares about the kids, and I think the parents know it, and I think the kids know it. And we were talking a little bit about this uh, federal money we're getting. I think we got a lot to learn from what you're doing right here. I mean, we have a lot of resources. The president's coming into the state in two days, and I just want him to know that we're not going to waste our shot, if you know Alexander Hamilton, that um, we're going to use this money, we're going to use it in a very prudent and thoughtful way, and some of it can be STEM, and some of it can be the three R's, some of it can be um, Lexia, is that what it was? Uh, it's sort of online learning, but a lot of it's about the kids. And a lot of that's the kids being part of a community and the kids getting back into the game. And um, that's what Charlene and I are trying to do this uh, summer with our summer learning camps. Um, Ellen, I really hope uh, you and Parks and Rec, we're, we're teammates on this. A lot of that's about getting back up to speed in terms of uh, old-fashioned learning. A lot of it's about just getting back up to speed in terms of being with your friends and socializing and getting out to the aquarium and going to the museums, all of which we're going to make available at no cost to any of these kids in our camps. Um, you've been lucky. Your kids have had the opportunity to always be in school, at least 85% of them, which is extraordinary. 
But my heart goes out to a lot of the kids. We have close to 100,000 who haven't felt comfortable getting back into the classroom. And uh, Charlene and I are prioritizing making sure that each and every one of those kids come the beginning of the new school year hits the ground running. And I think um, what we've seen from the Gators, Alex, you taught us a lot in terms of how to do it right. You're really lucky to be at a great school like this. Thanks, everybody. We thank you for sharing our successes. Um, we thank you for your support. Um, and we are stand here proud to uh, be that example for other communities and other school systems. So thank you. Hey, thanks, everybody. We good? I have to. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, you, you mentioned the president coming in two days. Is, is he going to be touring schools, or is he just going to the Coast Guard Academy? I, I noticed you mentioned that. Is that uh, the president of the United States will be coming uh, on Wednesday primarily to give uh, the graduation commencement address at the Coast Guard Academy. So maybe you'll have a chance to look around a little bit afterwards. And speaking uh, on, on off topic, speaking about Wednesday, Wednesday is a big day for reopening the 19th, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what, are, what is the latest on that? In other words, um, will, will uh, particularly on the mask mandate, take us through that first. Will there be some uh, leeway there on, on um, leeway for the businesses, leeway for the restaurants on masks? Yeah. How will that work? So as I mean, most of you know, we have a very, very low infection rate. We got uh, almost 75% of our adults uh, vaccinated. So on Wednesday, um, we're saying uh, we're opening up uh, indoors and outdoors. Um, masks are um, optional unless you haven't been vaccinated and you're indoors. Then we want you to continue to wear the mask. But uh, Chris, uh, we're going to find that um, a lot of our stores and restaurants, they have their own set of rules because sometimes um, uh, cu customers feel a little more comfortable uh, wearing the mask. And uh, I think some stores will do that. And I think we're going to ask the kids and um, and teachers to continue wearing the mask, uh, at least through this school year, just because really the kids haven't been vaccinated and it's the safest way to go. And also businesses in, in general uh, have a lot of leeway. They want to take people back. They don't want to take people back. People working at home, not at home. Uh, how will that work and how, how will that change Wednesday, if at all? Uh, the, the main thing is it's up to the, um, the stores. It's up to the restaurants. Um, I think certainly the employers I've talked to, they said, please, I want all of our employees uh, to be vaccinated. That's better. It's a lot better from um, fellow employees' point of view in terms of confidence and in terms of customers. They're probably not requiring that in most cases at this point, but it's a strong recommendation. And I think when it comes to customers coming into the restaurant, that's going to be up to the restaurant owner. Outside, no need to wear the mask. A little bit, but I think Connecticut's been pretty good so far. I mean, okay, you can get yourself a fake vaccination card and sneak into the restaurant and get a free drink if you want, but I'd like to think the other 99.9% .9 of people just aren't going to do that. And uh, I'm not, we're not policing it. We're not enforcing it. We're just asking people to do the right thing. Twelve to fifteen is going uh, very strong. Um, I think I heard that from um, Ellen, if I'm not mistaken, and um, I've heard that from our um, public health team as well. The younger ages, um, jury's out. I don't know when we're going to hear anything in terms of when the vaccines are available to them. I don't even know if it's going to be this summer. We'll see. Governor, what we learned was 12.4 percent coverage for the 12 to 15 age group so far. Um, consider they just only got approval Thursday. They seem to be taking advantage of that. It's pretty good. And, and is it still in uh, uh, inverse proportion? In other words, uh, the oldest groups have the highest level because they've had, had the most time for vaccination? Or how, how, how has that been looking? Yeah. It's been pretty consistent, except I was telling um, Ellen, the um, 16 and 17 year olds have a, a slightly higher vaccination rate than the 20 somethings. I think mom and dad maybe have a little more influence over the 16 and 17 year olds. A little more. <laughs> Thank you.
Thanks, everybody.